I'm here with John Hagel, who I've been following personally for at least five years and who is a uh, you know, thought leader helping advise the most advanced uh, companies that are impacting all of our lives in Silicon Valley. Uh, and you know, he's, he's the founder of the Deloitte Center of the Edge, wh whose mandate is to help uh, executives anticipate and address emerging opportunities and challenges, which is exactly the kind of uh, you know, help that I think that a lot of us need right now to address this opportunity and challenge, which are often the same thing. So John has been thinking about this stuff for decades, deeply, and we would love to, we would love you to share your, your main ideas to help people out at this point in time. So the first thing that we wanted to maybe go over was the, your, your Zoom out, Zoom in framework. Can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. This is a framework that originally uh, developed uh, as a strategy for companies and came about because I've worked with some of the most successful tech companies in Silicon Valley. And I find that they pursue a very different approach to strategy than most traditional companies. I've come to call it zoom out, zoom in, because it focuses on two very different time horizons. One time horizon is 10 to 20 years. And on that horizon, the questions are, what is our relevant market or industry gonna look like 10 to 20 years from now? And what are the implications for the kind of business we need to be to be successful in that market or industry? That's the zoom out, 10 to 20 years. Zoom in, very different time horizon. It's six to 12 months. And on that horizon, the questions are, what are the two or three initiatives, no more, two or three that I could pursue in the next six to 12 months that would have the greatest impact in accelerating my movement towards that longer term opportunity and destination? And do I have a critical mass of resource against those two or three initiatives in the next six to 12 months? So it's very powerful in the sense of at one, I think one of the uh, issues that I see increasingly around the world, and this was before the current crisis, was a shrinking of time horizons. You know, the world was changing so rapidly, so much uncertainty, we tended to fall back into what I call a reactive approach to the world. You know, just sense and respond as quickly as you can to whatever's going on. But the challenge with that is, if that's all you do, you spread yourself way too thin because there's so much going on. If you're responding to everything, you're not gonna have impact on anything. And so the power of this approach is, it forces a focus on a longer term opportunity, a sense of destination. One of my favorite quotes is, if you don't know where you're going, you're never gonna get there. And so this helps you to frame, where am I going? What's the big opportunity? And then on the other side, very focused on short-term impact. What can I do today to really accelerate my movement? So the, the, and the combination of the two, uh, I find that the, the groups that pursue this have a, a learning mindset. They're constantly wanting to learn what impact have they achieved with their short-term initiatives? How does that re evolve their view of the big opportunity? How can they shape the near-term initiatives to have even more impact? So they're constantly like driving. Me. Exactly, exactly. And, um, so. and, and these tools, I mean, the, 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 the normal place for these tools is in a, in a corporate setting. And what you're suggesting is to apply the same ideas to the, to the individual, to the self level, especially if, you're, if you've been upended by what's going on. Now, one thing that I, I'd like you to comment on is that there has been this big trend, which I've personally seen in the entrepreneurial world for, and from my own experiences and studies, where uh, people are throwing out the kind of five-year business plan and they're like, oh, you can't plan, you can't plan what's gonna happen, you know? So, uh, you know, how do you respond to that? You're, you're, you're pushing us back to no, there is value in planning on even longer horizons. Yeah, it's a, yeah two questions there. I'll do that. I'll respond to the last one around uh, the planning and five-year plans. I think the interesting thing for me is the companies that pursue the zoom out, zoom in approach, basically, you know, they pay very little attention to one to five years. That's not their focus. Their focus is 10 to 20 years and six to 12 months. Mm -hmm. And yes, they plan at those levels, but it's not, a, it's not a detailed operating plan. It's a high level view of what's that big opportunity that we could go for. 
and then very specific actions today that we can take. So, and their view is if they get that right, the, everything else will take care of itself over time. So they're, they're not five-year planners by any means. They're, they're focused on these two, two horizons. And okay. then you, you asked the question about the individual, how it applies to the individual. And uh, over time, I've come to believe that while this, uh, I originally came, uh, developed this perspective looking at companies, I think it's very powerful at the individual level. You know, I think so many of us are consumed by the day-to-day -day demands on our time, and we're spreading ourselves way too thin as individuals. And relatively few of us have really made the effort to look ahead and say, what is that big opportunity that really could excite us and motivate us and keep us focused? And then on the other side, being very thoughtful about a very limited number of initiatives that really matter and making sure that we pay sufficient attention to those rather than again getting consumed by the daily demands on our time and so i think this can be very effective at the individual level so okay so now now we have this time where you know uh, in this uh, great reset as uh, gary your colleague gary bowles called it uh, yes. we're sitting here where we have these ex existential questions so step 1 in this process that you're um, you know re uh, recommending i guess is to spend some time con in deep contemplation about where do you see yourself 10 years, 20 years. That, that could be a, you know, a little mini workshop that you do with yourself with a pen and paper. How, how would you approach that? No, I think I, it has a number of components to it. I, I think there's one piece which is just really being thoughtful about what is it that excites you and motivates you. Um, because I, I don't think enough of us are really driven by, by reflecting on what is that and, and what's the opportunity that really excites us. I mean, what are we trying to achieve? What, what excites us about trying to achieve something? And then I think there's the parallel effort of looking ahead and saying, okay, is that really achievable the way the world is evolving? I mean, you know, we, some of us could have dreams that are completely unrealistic relative to the way the world is, is evolving. So we've, we need to find a way to integrate both what excites us and where that future is going so that we are going to achieve something really significant and the future is going to help us to do that. Can I, can I, can I pause the, uh, the, the, yeah, the sentence? What excites you at the moment? I, I've written about this. I mean, it, it goes into a whole other topic. Uh, we've become very, uh, one of our key themes in our work is in an exponentially changing world, we have to accelerate our learning and performance improvement. And in, if that's the case, we ended up looking at a whole variety of environments like extreme sports and online war games where there's sustained, sustained extreme performance improvement. We said, what can we learn from those environments? Low state. The, sorry? Low state. Low state. <laughs> well, in this case, it, it's all connected. But in this case, what we came up with was all the participants in these, in these arenas had a very deep, specific form of passion. We call it the passion of the explorer. And they were really driven by something that excited them and where they were driven to have more and more impact in whatever domain was exciting them. So they were excited by challenges. They were connecting with others so they could learn faster about how to address those challenges. And I think that's, again, part of this exercise in Zoom Out is figuring out what is it that really excites you and is it did consistent I, with where the future is going? Did, did I interpret correctly that what excites you is what is exciting other people? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, so I'm sorry. That was a, a diversion. I, I, over time, I, I've reflected on my own passion. And while it takes different forms in different periods of my life, the, the underlying passion that I've come to recognize and, and drives me still is how to create platforms to help people achieve more of their potential. Mm -hmm. That ultimately, it's about helping others to achieve more of their potential through platforms that connect them in more effective ways. So Beautiful. that's really Thank you for sharing that. Okay, I, I hope that uh, our audience can take inspiration. You know, it's kind of like the, the metaphor of be, being of service, you know, 
helping other people to achieve their dreams. Your dream is to help other people achieve their dreams, that kind of thing. It's a little bit meta. But okay, so that was the stage one is like doing that deep work uh, on, you know, uh, finding your passions. I, I think that's something which uh, is worth a lot of uh, uh, study and, you know, analysis because it's, it's something that I've been coming across a lot with my, in my conversations. If someone is not really sure what they're passionate about, it's pretty hard to figure it out. Um, one, of the, one of the examples that I've uh, come across for that, and it, it was just mentioned in a previous talk as well independently, was starting with curiosity. What are you curious about? And that's a thread that you can pull to find a, a potential passion. Any other uh, approaches to that? Certainly what you're curious about, a very powerful way to start to identify passion. I think part of it, another way is just to reflect on, you know, in your life, what, where have you, when have you been most excited? And when have you gotten the most satisfaction and most sense of accomplishment? And those kinds of things. And, and again, I think it, you need to pull apart because many of us are doing things because society expects it or our family expects it. And so, yes, when we get the good grades because our parents wanted us to, we're happy. No, it's what really excited you regardless of what others were saying and, and trying to see what are the common elements across those many different experiences that, that did excite you to begin to identify what is that passion that's really dri potentially could drive you if you really cultivated it. Okay, so now, now we've, uh, we've dove a little bit deep into the 10, 20 year plan, uh, trying to identify passions. Okay, let's hope that we've found some by now. <laughs> now we're moving to the six to 12 month horizon, okay? Uh, and considering, I, I, I understand that California has just, uh, or Los Angeles has just said that people are gonna be inside for two to five months. Now that's gonna be overlapping into that six to 12 month uh, period. So how, how do we reconcile those? What's the, what's the approach for translating that into next steps and, um, and you know, shorter term plans? Well, well it's interesting because, uh, you know, I, in the in the network of people that I connect with, and I'm even though I'm physically isolated, I'm still quite connected <laughs> through other means. Um, one of the common elements that I'm hearing from so many people is that the result of all this change right now is that it's forcing them to really, or being a catalyst for them to step back and reflect on what really matters. You know that that now they're suddenly saying. You know, life is going to change in some fundamental ways. What really matters? And then what are the things that are distracting me on a daily basis that shouldn't be there, that I shouldn't be paying attention to because this is what really matters and I should be focusing more time and attention on that. So I think people without knowing it, in many cases, are actually going through that exercise of stepping back and saying, given what matters, what are the things that I could be doing in the very short term that would help accelerate my movement and achieve more impact in that area? And so I'm optimistic actually that this, this crisis is becoming a catalyst for that kind of reflection at the individual level. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and do you have any approaches? One thing that comes to mind when you're, when you're zooming out to, to such a level, the 10 to 20 year level, You've translated that into an action plan, which is starting from now until the, you know, the, the short, to, short to medium term plan. On a 10 to 20 year level, it's very hard to have like direct feedback whether you're on the right track. Do you, have, do you agree with that? Are there any sort of solutions for that or sort of ways to solve that? Yeah. No, I, I, it's an important question. I think that the, the advice is, as you think about the big opportunity that, that excites you and that motivates you, and you start to think about what are the actions I can take in the short term, whenever you identify a, an action, identify what are the metrics that would tell me whether I've accomplished what I thought I was going to accomplish and actually accelerated my movement towards that longer term opportunity. And then take the time, not just at the end, at the after six months or 12 months, but actually maybe even on a daily basis, if not weekly, step back and say, am I making the progress that I thought I was going to make and having the impact of relative to the metrics? Are you an OKR person? 
Uh, in, in context, yes. I think certainly having a sense of what are the metrics that matter is critical, both at the level of companies and at the level of individuals, having a sense of really reflecting on what are those metrics. I mean, people with passion are constantly driven, but they have a set of metrics in their mind of what, what would constitute more impact in this domain. And they're constantly reflecting on, am I making, not just making progress, but accelerating. I mean, again, they're driven to accelerate, not just step by step, but. Well, that's, a, that's a real nugget there, not just being uh, content with progress, but like geometric progression. Uh, and uh, this also uh, correlates a lot with the biohacking movement, which our audience is going to be largely consisting of, which is yeah. metrics, tracking, personal metrics, you know, how many minutes of meditation did I do? How many uh, push-ups did I do? How many weights did I lift? How many you know, combined kilos did I lift? And then taking that into mission, work, contribution, service, etc. I think we, we, we should be able to resonate with that. No, very much. At least the biohackers I know, there's a, there's a strong element of passion there, uh, even though they may not have stepped back to articulate it and reflect on it. Mm -hmm. They're driven. They're they're excited by the opportunity. And I'll say one other thing that I think is important in terms of the zoom out, zoom in, is particularly in a time like today with the crisis that we're facing with the virus. Um, there there is a natural human tendency to become afraid. The dominant emotion becomes fear. You know, we're facing something we've never faced before. This is, you know, could be the end of the world. Uh, we're all going to die. You know, fear becomes the dominant emotion. And it's certainly fed by the news media and a whole lot of other <laughs> um, media. But I think that the, the power of this approach, zoom out, zoom in, is it, it pulls you out to say, what's a big opportunity that could inspire and excite me in the future? So now I've got some excitement and inspiration. And then the zoom in with those short-term initiatives builds confidence and credibility. As I start to make progress on those short-term initiatives, it convinces me that big opportunity that excites me is not just a fantasy or a dream. It's actually something that I'm making progress towards. So it helps to overcome the fear and really build more excitement and, and courage to, to move forward. Nice, nice, which will feed back on itself, I presume. So, okay, so we've covered yeah. the zoom out, uh, zoom in framework. There was one other thing that you mentioned that we spoke about yesterday, which uh, caught my attention, especially for people who are having, uh, you know, challenging times right now or in, in crisis, not, not only uh, health-wise, but mainly career-wise, and that was leveraged growth. Can you, yeah. can you explain that one a bit? Yeah, it's a it's an approach to growth, which uh, is I we believe becoming more and more feasible and ultimately even necessary. Which is the traditional approach to growth is you either develop it, it yourself or you go out and buy it. You acquire the, the capabilities, resources. This is a third path to growth, which says no. The one way to add value in the marketplace is to connect with and mobilize a growing number of third parties to create more value for whoever you're serving, whoever your stakeholders are, and in the process capture some of that, some of that value for yourself. Mm -hmm. And in the process also learn together because you're connecting with a lot of very diverse resources and people and addressing needs of a, of a stakeholder. You can learn in that process what's really necessary versus just trying to do it all yourself. And I think, again, in a time where we're, we're in re, with reduced resources, having that mindset of how can I connect with and leverage my own resources with others to continue to create value to whoever I'm trying to serve can be a very powerful approach. Yes, and I, I, you know, that might sound uh, very abstract for our audience, but I would like to bring it down to, right down to reality. That is exactly what has happened that has allowed you and I to connect because it was, you know, this was a, this, this project was a, a on the shelf project. I saw what was happening. I took it off the shelf. I made it a priority. I reached out to, you know, um, a bunch of people, Gary Bowles ended up having a, a nice interview with me. And then I asked him who would he recommend? He recommended you. So that is absolutely 
a case study of leveraged growth. And that is something that anyone can do by picking up the phone, by having an idea, picking up the phone, picking up the email, sending something out. Is, is that what you mean? And doing it at scale, by the way. Yeah, and I think one of the things that is a bit countercultural or in, for many people is the notion of asking for help. Right. Often, if you ask for help, that's considered a sign of weakness. What do you mean? You, you can't do it yourself. <laughs> and, and one of the things that we see that's so powerful about this passion of the explorer that I mentioned is people with that kind of passion are constantly asking for help. Mm -hmm. They're driven to connect with as many people as they can who can help them get address the challenges that they're facing and get to higher and higher levels of performance. So. I think it's a it's a very powerful way to uh, again leverage your own capabilities and resources and learn in the process and have much more impact over time. Yeah, and and another one of the themes uh, from from this uh, g gathering or the, or the group that I've uh, uh, come across is the vulnerability um, uh, concept, which applies to asking for help. So the first, before you ask for help, you have to be vulnerable, make that request, do it in a classy way, and you know. Yeah, I think, again, it taps into a whole other theme of, of work we've been doing, which is this notion of how do you build trust or rebuild trust? I mean, one of the things that has been documented for decades now, not just in the current crisis, is erosion of trust in all of our institutions. Mm -hmm. And if you think about uh, the mark of a strong leader in our tr traditional institutions, is somebody who has the answer to every question. You can count on the leader to have the answer, no matter what the question is. Well, guess what? Mm -hmm. If a leader now is claiming they have the answer to every question, there are two possibilities. One is they have no clue about what the questions really are, or two, they're lying. <laughs> In either case, you're gonna not trust them. And that's quite and, relevant. That's quite fitting right now. <laughs> Yeah, yes, and the people, the people who build trust are those who are willing to say, I don't know, and I need help. And they're the ones, again, our, our view of what will mark a strong leader in the future is the one who has the most powerful questions yep. that right. inspire people and that where, where they're willing to say, I don't have an answer and I need help. I have a challenge question for you. That's, um, you know, you're, you're, you're a California person, you're on the kind of like edges of the, of the, the United States. Yeah. Isn't there a risk of, of that weakness being showed for the general population? Is the, well, how, do you, how do you see that as, um, I'm just curious as to your point of view there. No, I, I think that's the fear that leaders have, is if they, if they show that they don't know, they're, they're exposing themselves and they're gonna be thrown out. But I think increasingly in a world that's rapidly changing, that's going to actually attract people. You know, okay. finally, we've got somebody who, who realizes that they don't have all the answers and is re willing to ask for help and, and trying to get our help. Let's go in and help. I mean, okay. I think that actually can be very powerful. Yeah. Okay, look, we're on the tail end. Uh, you've shared a couple of uh, amazing ideas and uh, you know, I, I think they will add a lot of value to our audience. I'm very confident about that. Um, do you have any kind of parting words or extra thoughts yes, to, help people, <laughs> to help people navigate this, uh, this current uh, climate? No, I, I think, um, you know, I, I've come to I basically recommend looking ahead, looking around and looking inside. And, the looking ahead, as you, can, as you can imagine, has to do with the zoom out piece. Looking around has to do with this notion of connecting with others so that you can address the opportunities much more quickly and much more effectively than just trying to do it all yourself. And understanding the context of others and how to motivate them. And then looking inside is this notion of really self-examining. And I think many of us, although we won't acknowledge it, are driven by fear today. Mm -hmm. And just recognizing that and you know, being at home with it, that yes, I am afraid. Now what can I do to overcome the fear? Because if I pretend that I'm not afraid, the fear is just gonna fester there. So I think all three of those can be very powerful in terms of helping us to make progress in a rapidly changing and uncertain world.
Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. It is greatly appreciated on behalf of our audience and looking forward to the next episode, sir. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to share. Thank you. Okay.